I'm Anne Marie Slaughter. I'm the president uh, of New America, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you. Uh, this is the kind of event we will be doing much more of uh, with our new breadwinning and caregiving program headed by Liza Mundy. Uh, and I have to say, one of the great pleasures, I've, I've been in office for four months uh, and building this program and trying really to use the program to change the conversation. You note it is not called women and anything. It's not even called work and family because that's often code for women and children. Uh, it's called breadwinning and caregiving. It's, call, it's premised on the idea that we all are breadwinners and caregivers at different times in our lives. One of the things uh, that that gives on to is that after a caregiving period is finished, there's more time to do things like run for office. Uh, and of course, many of our uh, female politicians manage to combine being a politician and being a ca full-time caregiver, or pro what I think of as a lead caregiver, because very few of us are really full-time. Uh, at this point, but it's been uh, very neat for me to see some of my own friends starting to think about running for office precisely as their kids go off to college, and it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful, uh, I think, example when people say, what should I do uh, when I have an empty nest? Uh, run for office, change the country. <laughs> uh, so t just two other things that I wanted to say, um, or one other thing. One is I'm reading John Meacham's biography of Thomas Jefferson. And I grew up in Charlottesville. I could tell you Thomas Jefferson's history backwards and forwards. Never have I seen a biography of Jefferson that points out that he did not go to France the first time he was asked because he wanted to stay with his wife and family. Never have I seen a biography that des describes his complete collapse after the death of his wife and the agreement not to remarry. So this is called Founding Mothers and you know, there are many different ways, obviously, in which we'd like to see founding mothers going forward. But I just would say, when we tell history true, when we tell history from the point of view who, of people who think about caregiving as well as breadwinning, who think about all the dimensions of our neighbor, of our nature, then even the history we know so well with our founding fathers looks a little different. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Liza and uh, wish all of you a fabulous panel. And I will be then able to see it on the podcast. <laughs> Yes. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Liza Mundy. I'm the director of the Breadwinning and Caregiving Program here. Um, and I'll introduce our incredibly illustrious panel. I just wanted to say that this event originated um, with just an idle question that I had had. I'm born and raised in the state of Virginia, live in Arlington. Um, I remember in the 1980s when Mary Sue Terry was elected Attorney General of the state of Virginia, the first woman we had in our um, higher state office, and it looked like it might be the beginning of a trend line for women. And it really hasn't been in the state of Virginia. And I periodically have wondered, you know, why has our state not produced more women leaders? Why has South Carolina had a woman uh, governor, North Carolina? What's the difference between our states? What are the paths to progress for women politicians? Um, and then. When, when the state of New Hampshire delivered an entire delegation <laughs> of women to Congress um, in the past year, I was thinking, okay, so what's different about New Hampshire? And it just so happened that I posed that question to Alexandra Starr, who is an Emerson Fellow at the New America Foundation, and I, I, we were just chatting, and she said, well, as it happened, I've just written a story about that exact question for Moore Magazine. Um, Moore Magazine, which is a great magazine uh, with wonderful, smart editors, um, uh, had, had thought of that uh, very question and sought out, set out to answer it. Moore is co-sponsoring this event. Uh, Nanette Varian, who was Alexandra's editor, is here. So we're very grateful to her for coming down. We're very grateful to Moore for thinking of this and assigning it to Alexandra, who did a great job on the piece. So, um, and, and she'll be talking about that. So we're very fortunate to have here to answer this very question. Um, Congresswoman Ann Custer, who is from the state of New Hampshire. We have Stephanie Shriak, who is from Emily's List, um, president of Emily's List. We have Jennifer Duffy, who is a senior editor for the Cook Political Report, uh, where she is responsible for U.S. state and Senate and governor's races. She has 20 years, 26 years of experience writing about these issues. Um, 
And we have a Representative Shelley Pingree from the state of Maine. Um, and I should say both Representative Custer and Representative Pingree are the first women to represent your districts uh, in your state. So they um, are very, very well positioned to talk about women's paths to power in, um, in, in different states and the way that these paths are changing. Uh, so I think, and then we have Alexandra Starr as well, who's going to talk about her piece. And I'm hoping that it will be a lively and relatively casual conversation. I'll moderate it, but feel free to jump in, to respond to each other, to answer each other. If there's something that you want to talk about, um, feel free to uh, have it be a free-flowing conversation. But I thought we would start by asking the two members of Congress, and incidentally, they will um, they will have to leave at about 1 o'clock, so there will be a, a graceful exit, and we will continue <laughs> our <votes>. conversation. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it, and I should say, actually, New America is a nonpartisan think tank. We did invite several Republican member of, members of Congress here. Um, it's very difficult for members of Congress to arrange their schedules or even to know whether they'll be available um, because of votes that are going on. So we invited Senator Ayotte from New Hampshire um, and several others who just weren't able to be here. But those of us who are reporters and analysts, we will do our best to represent the, um, the Republican viewpoint and to make it a nonpartisan conversation. Uh, so I wondered, uh, we'll start with Representative Custer, if you could just give us five minutes or so talking about how you, uh, how you came to run for office. Happy to do so, and thank you very much. It's a great honor and privilege to be here with all of you, and uh, particularly my dear friend Shelley Pingree, who's been a wonderful mentor, and I, I want to say that's probably the most important word that I'll use throughout the conversation, but... Um, to be welcomed into the Congress. Uh, Shelley reached out even before while I was running and, and has made a huge difference for me since. And Stephanie Shriak, I definitely couldn't have done this without Emily's list. Um, so I think you're getting a theme. You don't do this alone. You do it. Um, it takes a village. So um, it's, it's great to be here. So I'm super proud, obviously, to be a member of this all-female delegation uh, with my bipartisan colleagues, so Senator Jean Shaheen, um, Senator Kelly Ayotte, Carol Shea Porter, and myself. New Hampshire is a, an incredible um, anomaly right now, and we're just very proud of it because our governor is also female, our Speaker of the House is also female, our Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is also female, um, so we say in New Hampshire, if you want something done, ask a busy woman, and it, it seems to be working for us. Um, truthfully, it's no accident, and I think we'll get into it more when we talk about the Moore Magazine article, which is a great piece, but um, let me try to identify a few of the elements, some that are unique to New Hampshire, but many that are not. So Starting with the one that's most unique to New Hampshire, we have uh, 400 members of our House of Representatives, 24 members of the Senate. So it's um, always been equal opportunity. My mother was 25 years in the New Hampshire legislature, and when I was a girl, they uh, referred to it as women's work. They, um, they don't get paid very much, $200 every two years. But what it means is that, yeah, every two years. <laughs> Uh, whether they need it or not. Uh, so what it meant when I was growing up is that it was um, a lot of women. When she was in the New Hampshire legislature, there was more women in New Hampshire than all the other states combined. Um, but what was great is that they proved that they could manage the process, leadership. She was chair of the Ways and Means Committee. She uh, worked long and hard on the tax structure of the state of New Hampshire. Um, so, and, and this was true across the board. And so when we got to the modern era, um, it wasn't a big leap for us to have a, a female Senate president, a female Speaker of the House, and then people running for higher office. Um, the other thing that is not unique to New Hampshire, and I think makes an enormous difference, is that the women that went before us were very engaged in building up other women and in, in reaching out and bringing other women along. Um, my mother, for example, was one of the founders of the National Women's Political Caucus and the Women's Campaign Fund, uh, now Forum. Um, and she believed very, very strongly that we needed more women in political office. And I can remember as a girl, 
Um, she would host big events in the summer at our house on the lake, and she would constantly be bringing women through. And um, uh, in fact, when Pat Schroeder considered running for president, she came to, to our home. And so it was something that uh, I think is lacking in some other states. Our neighboring state of Massachusetts, it's a very difficult environment. We now, Catherine Clark, who was just elected in a special election, is um, actually the first member of that delegation elected in her own right from the state senate. Uh, Nikki Songus, our wonderful colleague, um, came up when, when her husband, Paul Songus, passed away. But it's a very different environment, just sort of a good old boy world that's a tough, tough nut to crack. Um, the other, the other thing that I wanted to just mention is how women do get things done. And I think when the voters begin to recognize that, and that's obviously happened in New Hampshire, but it's a, it's a dialogue and a narrative that I'm sure uh, Stephanie and Shelley and others will speak to. But if you just look at the most recent example of the budget breakdown and the um, shutdown of the government, Voters across the board, male and female, think that Congress is broken. They think that this is dysfunctional, that it's not serving the needs of the people. But what you saw in Shelley's colleagues, Susan Collins, and uh, my colleagues, uh, Jean Shaheen and Kelly Ayotte, was that it was the women that came together and said, we have to take care of this. We have to fix this. And in the House, we have strong relationships. Um, among women uh, on both sides of the aisle working on issues like um, military sexual trauma and um, how we treat our veterans um, and, and there are many, many other examples of it. Um, so I'll, I'll probably wrap up there, but just to say that um, I think it does have to do with setting a tone and a tenor um, that the first few women make it an important example and if they set the tone that they want to encourage others, that makes a tremendous difference. Um, I know as an attorney for 25 years when I came into an all-male profession, some of the women had gotten there and felt like they could make it. What's wrong with you? And it makes a big, big difference if people turn around and reach back and say, I can help you. Um, you know, I want to. And, and just even in the smallest of ways, but they end up being the biggest of ways. For Shelley to invite me to her home was incredibly meaningful for me, and it meant that I started to meet people and get involved in issues that are, will be with me for a long, long time. So I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. So I have some thoughts, and I'll, I'll save them um, until we start our conversation. And so Congresswoman Pingree, would you mind just talking about your own, how, sure. how you got started? In sure. Your and thank you to Annie for all that. Um, Nice praise, and thank you for running for Congress and, and being here with us, and to Stephanie and w Emily's List and all the great supporters that we do have along the way, and to everyone else who's here on the panel. This is great. So I'm going to dig back a little bit deeper. I completely concur with everything that Annie says, but in, uh, in an effort not to repeat everything, I'm going to go back to my first uh, uh, election um, beyond my, my involvement in local politics. So I um, first got involved as a state legislator in 1992. So I've got a little bit longer history, and I go back to a time where I think it was even a little bit more challenging, um, although 1992 was the year of the woman. Yeah. <laughs> so there were some interesting factors in. I would say some things we've backslid and some things we're doing right. fine with. But a little bit of a story, and I'm glad that Pat Schroeder got brought up because she is an important part of my running for office. I had three children at the time. Um, I'm trained as an organic farmer. I was running a small business, an organic farm, and the last thing I ever imagined I would do is run for office. Um, but Pat Schroeder came to Maine and she was going to speak in Portland and another mother and I decided we would pack up our young teenage daughters and take them down to listen to Pat Schroeder speak. So um, I, again, I, I lived uh, a long way from Portland, Maine. I uh, lived in a very rural, small community and it was a big deal to take our girls out to go do this thing. And Pat Schroeder gave a wonderful speech to people, uh, a wonderful role model in Congress and she said, one of the most discouraging things, this is 1991 or so, um, is that good people don't want to run for office anymore. You know, it's not a revered thing to be in Congress. Welcome to my current world. <laughs> um, but, you know, young people don't want to do this. And I happen to be on my local school board. So I love local politics. I thought that was the most fascinating thing to get with your friends and neighbors and figure out how your kids should be educated. I just thought it was the greatest thing. And I thought, who would ever not want to be in 
in, in an opportunity to do something so great. I walked out with my daughter, and a woman who was serving in the state senate came up to me. So uh, another woman came to me, and she had been to my vegetable stand. So she knew who I was, and she knew I was from Knox County, Maine, and she said, hey, you know, we can't find a candidate in your district. Um, you should think about running for office. So immediately in my head, I said, oh my goodness, I got a small business, I live in a tiny little community, um, and um, you know, I've got all these kids, I can't possibly do that. And I turned to my daughter, who was about 13, and I said, Hannah, what do you think? And she said, you know, Mom, I think you should go for it. And it was one of those things which um, completely doesn't fit into the mold, and I think this is still often true for women. And the first thing you think about is all your other obligations. You know, who would make lunch for my husband? Who would take care of my kids when they got home from school? What about my employees? What would my community say? And it was a real struggle in my mind, and the most important thing was that I realized, you know, this is a great opportunity, and this could be a really amazing thing to do. So thanks to my daughter, and to another woman suggesting that I run, only later did I find out that I would be running on the Democratic ticket, and this was a profoundly Republican <laughs> and independent district. It was only 20% Democrat. So of course they couldn't find a candidate, and I was a total long shot. I had never been registered in a party in the Democratic Party. I had never gone to a party function, and I think all that was to my advantage. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to. I didn't know all the party leaders. I didn't know who they wanted to choose. I put together a little volunteer crew one of the things about running for the main legislature, it's not quite as big as New Hampshire, but you are expected to go door to door. I had 21 communities, little tiny rural towns. Um, my good fortune was that I happened to run a knitting business. So uh, selling knitting wow. products and also my little farm. So I would go to people's doors and lovely old ladies would say, you're the knitting woman. <laughs> or other men would say, well, you're a small business owner. And interestingly, just a couple other points. I. Um, I did not take all the advice from the party because there was a lot of sort of givens. You know, you don't do this in a republic district. You should be much more moderate. You should do all these things. And you should never say you're pro-choice. My opponent was staunchly anti-choice. He had served in the House. He was trying to move up to the Senate. So he was, um, for all intents and purposes, the incumbent. And I thought, well, I've got to run as a woman. I've got to run as exactly who I am, a left-wing liberal. I've got to run uh, on all these things that I believe in. And frankly, in the end, I think it was women in my district, whether they were 82 or 22, who said, you know, this is our opportunity. I crushed my opponent, 62% of the vote, wow. and, you know, turned everybody around about maybe a Republican district could be represented by a Democrat if she got out her votes and the people that she wanted. Now, I do want to say, I think one of the biggest challenges for women is often what goes on in our own heads. Um, I just gave you a hundred reasons why I didn't think it would go over too well in my family or my community. And there were a lot of people in my little town who would say, well, you can't do this. You know, what will happen to your family? What will happen here? And I distinctly remember uh, we would go to all these town meetings and my opponent, who was probably in his 60s, he ran an important construction company in this district. The name was on all the trucks. He came in in a, you know, appropriate little trench coat and a hat. And I walked in in you know, my corduroy pants and my jacket, whatever it was I was wearing that day. And I looked at him and I thought, well, he belongs in the legislature. He looks exactly like what a state legislator looked like to me, a state senator, that's how they should dress. And I'm just you know, somebody's mom with the wrong kind of shoes and the wrong this, and mm -hmm. what do I know? And in the end, you know, as, as long as I could keep myself convinced that I had the right to run and that people would actually vote for me, you know, in the end, people were ready to say, this is over. He stumbled over a few things along the way, often because he would sort of criticize me as a woman business owner, what do you know? Um, and it all worked to my advantage. But I will just say that I think often it is the challenges of what you convince yourself you can't do. I could never raise that much money. I could never you know, possibly pull all these things together. I don't know enough people. Um, and I also, I have read and seen that um, maybe one of the reasons um, women do better in certain states is because there's less of an influence of a strong party. Now, I don't know what New Hampshire is exactly yeah. like. We're all New England. But Maine didn't have a strictly organized party system that you had to work up the ranks and somebody was going to tell you what you could and couldn't do. And often the women who do all right are the ones who just jump in anyway. Yeah. Um, so I would say some of those things, we have some of the same traditions as um, New Hampshire because we're New England. We've had a lot of women who serve on their local boards, who do all these other things in local government. We have 40, 400 small municipalities, so we're a state of small towns, and we're used to women being in those positions. And I do think, not unlike New Hampshire, it gets people used to this idea. But I'll, I'll stop there. Those are some of my um, 
you know, my big facts about Well, that's it. great. I think we have a clear path to success <laughs> now. It helps to have a mother who is early involved <laughs> and in daughter. politics. And that's right. And have a file card, which you haven't talked about. The, the, oh, the, files, the, the file cards that you found that your mother had kept of all the Christmas cards that she sent out with careful annotations about newborns it, and it divorces and this, this, this like treasure trove of political conduct. So that's yeah. one good path to success. Yeah. Being a knitter, being known <laughs> as a knitter is also really good. So we and, have. And I should have said, I forgot to conclude, I, I have the opposite situation as yeah. Annie. Um, when I ran for the United States Senate in 2002 and lost and later came back to run for Congress, my daughter came home from college. Um, this was the daughter who had then grown up and came to work for me. She was ready to go to law school. She said, I'll take a little break and work for your campaign. And then luckily for me, about a year into it, somebody tried to recruit her for running for the legislature. And she came to me and I got to say to her, yeah, Hannah, you should go for it. And my daughter became the youngest speaker of the House in the main legislature and then was term limited after eight years. So um, it is a nice little mother-daughter story. I didn't have a mother in politics, but I now have a daughter who will. <laughs> okay, so we are Mark my word, she will run against me any day, but I'm still here. <laughs> so, Alexandra, based on your reporting about New Hampshire, perhaps you can help us find the patterns here in terms of what the formulas for success is for women, how it's changing, mm -hmm. and what the, um, you talk about an, um, some of the internal barriers. That, that There are external barriers, we'll talk about those, but maybe you could talk about some of the internal barriers as well. You've probably heard the line that when, um, uh, 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 when a man looks in the mirror, he sees a state senator, he sees a future U.S. senator. And um, that's not really the case for women so much. What is interesting to me is that you are beginning to see a change with my generation. Um, so the two youngest female um, senators are Senator Gillibrand and um, Senator Kelly Ayotte, who represents um, New Hampshire, so I spent some time with her for this piece. And um, their trajectory into office is a little more reminiscent of what you see with male colleagues over the past several decades. So oftentimes they'll serve as a prosecutor. Or in the case of um, Senator Gillibrand, she worked for a high-powered law firm. She became a powerhouse fundraiser. She moved to a district where there was a vulnerable Republican incumbent, and she beat him. <laughs> and she, you know, she really also did a very good, you know, there's a competitive uh, situation to become the replacement for Hillary Clinton in the US Senate. And you know, she aggressively campaigned for that, and she got that as well. And then one in a landslide. Um, so when I see those trajectories, you know, those women both have young children and they're serving in the US Senate. Historically, when you saw women in very high positions of power, like say Madeleine Cunin, who served as governor of Maine, their trajectory was a little different. Oh, they, God. yeah. The, Vermont. Vermont, sorry. <laughs> Vermont. Their trajectory was different. You know, they started, it was sort of like an extension of their volunteer work is how they got into public life. So Governor Cunin um, first got interested or attended her first town hall meeting when she began to campaign for sidewalks for her kids because she felt it wasn't safe for them to walk to school. Um, and because in some of those New England states, as you said, Massachusetts is a different beast. But in those states, the pay is so low to serve in state legislators. It's a pretty, um, that ramp on makes a lot of sense to be involved in your community, meet a lot of people, you know, marshal those volunteers. That really can serve as the base for a political campaign. Um, so that, I think, makes Maine and New Hampshire, and to a certain extent, Vermont, unusual. When you look at states like Massachusetts, um, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, you know, their <laughs> female representation in, that, in those states is pretty terrible. And a big reason for that is that this old boy machine that dominates the parties really decide who, who gets to run, period. So, um, you know, <laughs> it's kind of stunning, but 19 of 20 seats in um, the Pennsylvania delegation are held by men. So um, that's sort of wow. what I've seen. Like, there's just such a barrier in some cases to even get in the game. Interestingly, those legislatures, to be a state legislator, actually pays a living wage. You can support a family off of it. So that's another reason that men have sort of dominated in those states. It's changing. 
Um, and I imagine that with younger women, you know, feeling, well, you know, I went to law school, I have this big prosecutor, you know, I'm doing well, like, why not me? We'll see more of that. But, you know, in some states, the system really is stacked against them. That, that's really helpful. Um, it, it, there's an irony about the fact that the states that pay so little to the <laughs> legislators, that, that in yeah. fact turns out to be an entry point for women, that if you're not thinking of yourself as a breadwinner necessarily, um, so you can do this volunteer, in a way almost volunteer job. I don't know, there's, some, there's an irony there that I'm having sort of a hard time making sense of. Um, well, it, is, yes, it, is, it is interesting that it needs something else. So Colorado, for the last decade, has been fighting with New Hampshire on the percentage of women in their legislature. First, second, they take turns. You mean turns. buying? But how many women are in their legislature? Colorado is almost always number one in the country. Wow. Colorado, however, does not have the same type of success record when you look at their congressional races, their Senate races, their governorships. So it isn't just that. That is a piece of the story. But I think you heard, you know, particularly as Annie was talking about it, the importance of having someone there mm -hmm. to grab your sister and bring them in. Mm -hmm. That it's that there's a network building. And as Emily's List has been now working at this for 29 years to, to ensure that these two women and so many others uh, have had the opportunity, what we have found most helpful in recruitment is to have other members who are serving in Congress today get on the phones yeah. and say, this is what it's like. <coughs> And it's helping specifically with mothers of young children. Because we now have enough examples of women who are serving with young children who can really talk about, well, this is what it's like. You can choose to keep the kids in the district. You can move them to DC. Here's the schools. Here's the options. This is how we handle child care. This is you know, grandma's involved, grandpa's involved, dad's involved. Well, someone's going to be involved. But those are conversations that didn't happen 20 years ago. And we have an exceptionally large number of women running this cycle in 2014 with young children in tow, including one in Iowa who, by the way, when she wins, Stacey <laughs> Apple, she'll be the first woman, and I've noticed this in your story, the first woman ever elected from Iowa to Congress, period, <laughs> or a governorship. I was one of two states in the union, by the way, that has not succeeded in doing wow. so. Yes, Mississippi is the other one. My grandmother hates this fact because she lives in Iowa. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we're going to fix it. But Stacey Apple, six children. Wow. Six children. Um, now, that's a whole other story, and I'm not quite sure yeah, how she let me that that yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's quite astounding. I mean, Michelle Nunn has two little ones in, running for United States Senate Georgia. But they, there's just a great network of support uh, that helps these women out. And so, Jennifer, could you talk about, um, I, I don't know whether it's a, a bipartisan network of support or not, but could you talk about sort of um, Republican strategies for recruiting women? Kathy McMorris Rogers gave the response to the state of the President's State of the Union address. She has three small children, all of whom she had while she was in office. Exactly. And I think she's been instrumental in recruiting Republican women. Could you talk a little about whether there are different strategies between the parties? Yeah, ab well. Yes. Um, but first I want to say that when you ran for the Senate in 2002, you came to see me <laughs> and you brought your daughter Hannah. Huh. And when you left, I looked at a colleague and I said, candidate in training. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take long for True. me to be proven right. <laughs> but I have to say that Democrats have a much better infrastructure for women candidates than Republicans do. Um, although regardless of party, women face the same challenges. I mean, there are so-called Republican machines. They tend to come in the form of county, you know, the, 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 the Allenwood County Republican Party and, and sort of go through that. You're starting to see um, some groups crop up. Some of them are, are uh, you know, will help any Republican woman. Some of them are very conservative to help them raise money, but Republicans have never been able to, to replicate Emily's List as much as they've tried. But the other thing I'm seeing pop up, and I think it'll be successful depending on the state, depending on who's involved, are groups that want to do more than just raise money. You know, a friend of mine started about, uh, she did this in 2008, um, she started in Virginia, the farm team. Mm -hmm. 
And the idea wasn't so much to raise money. I mean, Mary Sue Terry was part of this, so you know, she, but to get women who'd worked on campaigns, run for office, to sort of be coaches. You know, this is what you do. This is how you, how you answer an attack. This is how you do these things. And women of both parties need more of that. Women who have experience, who've done it, because you can't answer the phone call of every woman candidate with a question. <laughs> You'd never leave your office. Um, that does sort of happen now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But wouldn't it be nice if yeah, <laughs> somebody was somebody? So no, there is a group a called Emerge, and I, you know, we'll see. Mm -hmm. so yeah. We'll see how they do. Well, and it's inter I'm, I'm glad you brought this yeah. up because you know Emily's list. Uh, for those of you don't, who don't know, started 29 years ago because. There was literally nowhere for a Democratic woman to go to get any financial resources. There was just nowhere to go. And so a group of women came together and said, well, we will be that source of money. And so that's how it started. And it started with the election of Barbara Mikulski, our, our first big victory, and has continued with you know, 19 Democratic women to the Senate and 101 to the House. Uh, but as the, as the years went on, we realized there were so many other things yeah. we needed. It wasn't just about the money, because uh, you know, after sort of the mid-90s, we realized we didn't have enough women in the pipeline right. to run. You know, so we had this network, but we needed to start trainings. And so Emily's List, uh, now 15 years ago, started our political opportunity program, trained over 8,000 women in partnership with mm -hmm. Emerge and other organizations around the country uh, to just get the idea started and to start building those networks. You put yeah. 45 women in a room in, in Maryland, which we just right. did a week ago. I mean, not only do we want each and every one of those women to run, but now they know each other. And they can support each other. And that's the best part of this growing network. So and why has it been harder for Republicans to create something like Emily's List? You know, first of all, you know, Republicans generally don't like institutions, period. <laughs> because I, you know, I, I even find that, I find that with um, even things like super PACs and campaign committees, and it's just very hard to centralize anything in the Republican Party. So I think that that's been a challenge. It's not that they haven't recruited women, it's not that they haven't supported women, but there's no Emily's List handing them women ready to run hmm. um, for office. But you know, and I s still think that they sort of come from the same opportunities that that Democratic women do. I call it climbing the ladder. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of them have held office. I looked um, at candidates running for the Senate, this time women, and I counted nine who I consider credible competitive candidates, because not every woman is, like not every man is. And seven of those nine hold or have held office. Um, there are only two that are, are kind of new to the process. So there is a process of climbing a ladder, and I think that, that that's true of both parties. And, and it, it's interesting, though, the states that do a pretty good job of sending women uh, congressional delegations, they do tend to be bipartisan. I mean, Washington state has sent a number of women, and, and not just Democratic women. So you do, again, sort of wonder if there's something about certain states and their uh, political well, system. Uh, redistricting has a little something to do uh -huh. with, uh -huh. with, uh, <laughs> with how a state as blue as Washington could send Republicans <laughs> to the Senate. And, and I have to tell you, seniority has something to do with it, too. I mean, you were talking about um, a state like Vermont that hasn't sent a woman to Congress. But I can count on one hand, because it only has one congressional district. So two senators, one congressional district. I can count on one hand the people who have served in those roles for the last 50 years. <laughs> you know, they get here and they don't leave. <laughs> There's very little turnover, which makes it difficult, um, difficult for women to move when there's, it's not really a glass ceiling, it's a seniority ceiling. Mm -hmm. It's an incumbency like, ceiling. Yes, yeah. it's an incumbency ceiling. It, Thank which you. We're, much we're very happy we have two incumbents sitting here. I want yeah. to know. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, interesting but it's, it's in New Hampshire, where we have two districts, even though the states are very similar, similar in size, but we have two districts and they have swung wildly back and forth. Not There's sure been how. more turnover in these two districts probably than in any other two next to each other over the last mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years. And in some ways, yes, I mean, I came in because it was an open seat. And, and um, I ran the first time I wasn't elected, but the, I was able to jump in. And, and back to Shelley's point about party, I didn't have anything to do with the party. <laughs> in fact, I was, 
you know, and, and I think it was great because I didn't know any better. And I, I didn't listen to anybody saying it's not your turn because it didn't interest me whose turn it was. You know, if they, and, and if I had listened to that, mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. would never have gotten off the dime. But, um, and interestingly enough, because we have so many women in politics, most of the candidates that people talked about were women. And I knew how much work it was going to be. My mother had run for the seat in 1980. I knew what it took to, to raise the money. And I said, OK, well, let me know when they decide. And in fact, in the meantime, I just got organized and, and got it done. So. And, and these open seats are where the opportunity so often lies for, for women in particular. It is easier to win an open seat than to beat an incumbent. It's not impossible to be an incumbent, but no. it's just easier. Uh, and so as, as we look at this as Emily's List, we're always tracking Looking the open, open seats. Seat. We were just yeah. talking right. back and said, there's been like nine house retirements in mm -hmm. the last four weeks. We're really busy at Emily's List <laughs> right yeah. now. Yes. Uh, exactly. Because this is, these are the opportunities. Uh, but I also want to point out that it also means we run a lot of primaries. Yes. And this is really important uh, to, to realize of the, I believe, 16 new Democratic oh. women elected Last, last, last cycle, eight of them came through primaries. Eight of them. And that's you know, something we're still, we're still contending with. You know, folks are like, well, why, why are you running in a primary? I'm like, well, why won't they clear it for us? Yeah. <laughs> that's what I want to know. Hey, that they're the men all the time. They, they do try to love. clear it. I get calls about clearing primaries. We yeah. choose not to. We well, like, I think, you know, and I think they're healthy and, for the party, I, frankly. But I think you're also true to your mission. And the Hawaii Senate primary, I'm sure that you are under a lot of, or were, under a lot of pressure to get out of that because it's an appointed incumbent. But, you know, you start to your principles. You, you, you got to do it. And there, you have a really strong candidate there. Yes, we do. I so. would say, too, um, you know, nobody ever wants to get into a primary. It always sounds easier if they clear the field, although I think it does sometimes strengthen your race because you've been out there for a while. But I was in a six-way primary of Democrats. Wow. I was the only woman. So that was one of those moments where having five men against a woman, there's just a, I was the first woman elected in that district, but I think that actually helped me because people would say, well, you know, there's some great men. Many of them I'd served with in the legislature. We were politically quite similar, but people would say, well, it's time to have a woman. You know, so I do think it, it was useful to me in a multi-candidate primary. In my case, if they'd cleared the primary, I would never be here. I, I was running against a, a female candidate, but having hung in there and having the primary, I won 72% of it. So, I mean, and just sometimes just, it's just as well not to, which is to give everybody a chance. Let the voters decide. And just to make sure everybody knows what it is to clear a primary, that means to... To discourage yeah. the other candidates. Right, right. To, right. to ask Which the other candidates. Which you kind of need a party boss right. to do that. Yeah. I mean, right. 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 There's, there's no, and, and sometimes I think people have a myth that there is a party that people sit down and everybody comes to an agreement and says, okay, you can run. <laughs> no. I mean, it's a rare state where that's Very highly functioning. Yes. So, yes. A, it rarely will happen. B, there aren't that many people who will say, if asked, you know, okay, I'll get out. I mean, it's your time. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Or you need a leader of the party who can sort of say, you know, we really need you to, to sort of step aside this time. And a lot of states have that. I think that, that Republicans in New Hampshire had that for a while. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But um, those are sort of getting, getting fewer. I mean, I don't think any Democrat in New York can run without Senator Schumer's permission. <laughs> <laughs> But he has female um, people he mentors, right? Like uh, yes. Kristen Gillibrand. Yes. Yeah. So I guess mm -hmm. it's sort of equal opportunity. You know, your comment about your primary made me think of Carol Shea Porter. Mm -hmm. um, she's the other um, congressional representative from New Hampshire. And she ran in 2006, which ended up being a phen phenomenal year for Democrats. Um, but she ran against the party's choice, yes. right? He yes, was serving in the didn't. state legislator, mm -hmm. le legislature. And she raised money in like $10 increments. She went all over the state. No one gave her a chance. And she won that primary, which really shocked people. It shocked everybody. And then she won the general election, which mm -hmm. you know is probably the biggest upset of that cycle. So Best um, ad ever. It was just her mother sitting on a couch saying why she thought she'd do such a great job. Hmm. It was, really it was like totally homemade. <laughs> Everybody said, are you kidding me? And people loved it. And is, totally that, is, that, is that the main thing that people credit for her victory? What, what in retrospect do yeah. people see? I mean, the, it, was, it was symbolic of she was contrary to every, um, every rule and lesson, and, and she does it her own way. And 
One of the things that I have learned is that the voters truly appreciate authenticity. Mm -hmm. And that's, it, it, I think women have an advantage if they play to their strengths. Shelley's story, you know, you're gonna have other people telling you, oh, you can't be pro-choice, you know, it's a Republican district. And Shelley's saying, no, 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 I'm gonna be true to my values. And every time you're true to your values, and, and your character and your temperament, whatever, if the voters can tell. And as I say to my staff, and it has the added advantage of being true, it's easier to remember. <laughs> it's easier <laughs> to remember, yeah. <laughs> is that if you are true to yourself, they can tell the difference. And Carol Shea Porter is very true to herself. And it doesn't work in every cycle. She was knocked out once and she came back. Um, but she's, the voters know that she is true to herself and to them. So what are the key external barriers for women, particularly in these, in these tough states like Virginia or Mississippi or whatever that, that aren't sending a lot of women either to Congress or to their own higher offices? Or is, it, is, it, is it just money? Is it just obviously money? Um, or, or is it the remnants of machine politics? Uh, what, what would you to, say? To me, the money is symbolic of why women get knocked out, they're not in the running to be in the running. Either they take themselves out of contention or other people don't take them seriously. And the number one most important thing that Emily's List does um, for women is to teach them how to be competitive. And the money gets overblown in a sense because it's the only number we have, it's the, it's the only measurable we have. So when you're months and months, if not years out from the election, um, to be in contention is to be the one that every three months, you know, we're measured. And um, if you don't participate in that, people can dismiss you very easily. But if you can crack the code, and I think women can, I think women can be very, very good at this. And it's because we tend relationships. It's because of the Christmas card list. It's because of the, the knitting and the, um, we tend relationships. And if we can help women to cross over to the place, I was talking about it with a colleague at the gym this morning and she said, think about it. Nobody else can pick up the phone and ask people for money and we're not selling them anything and they send you money. And I said, yes, but we are. We're selling a better America. You know, and I frequently will say this on the phone in a fundraising call, it's not for me, it's for America. <laughs> if you believe in our mission of a better, more functioning, higher functioning Congress, then participate in this, be a part of this. But I think that women do it in a different way, and my goal is to help candidates acknowledge, do it in a way that is within your comfort zone. If, if hitting people up the way guys do is not in your comfort zone, it's not gonna work in the long run. Mm -hmm. But if nurturing people and, and you know, having events and sending thank you notes and being gracious about it works for you, trust me, it'll work for your donors. They'll come back. They want people, they want this institution to work. And we at Emily's List probably spend more time than anything sitting with our candidates teaching them how to raise money. Painfully. Yeah. <laughs> Some would say It's the painful, wonderful truth it's about it's Emily's it's List. I mean, they do true. a great job. It is, and, and we have actually had just an incredible quarter. This, the, the end of the year report just came out, and our candidates have done very, very well, uh, which is good, because they they're gonna need a little extra boost in 2014. So we do spend a lot of time uh, teaching the basics of fundraising, not just at the congressional level, but like to start earlier, because those, those holiday card lists are gold mines, and everybody, all women in here should keep them now. <laughs> it's very, very important. But I also want to talk about other external things. And we, you started talking a little bit about this too, is there's just, there are districts in this country that have been held by incumbents for a very long time, and it's, until those start shifting, it is hard to, to open the floodgates. Mm -hmm. And in some places, there's now a bottleneck. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be a lot of people. For, for instance, in our, in our backyard from where we're sitting right now, Virginia A. Jim Moran mm -hmm. retired, mm -hmm. and there are 13 or 14 people <laughs> right. 
seriously thinking about running for Congress in the Democratic primary okay. uh, in that district because it's been so long. Right. And then yeah. all of a sudden, and we and there's one woman, one woman. one woman in that mix right now, but. At this point, I don't know how much that's going to change. There may be others in the there, there may be someone <laughs> thinking about it yeah. right now. But no, there's a wonderful Assemblywoman Herring who's seriously thinking about African American women, very, very strong candidate. Um, so we, we might be in a position where there is only one, and that, that actually makes it easier for Emily's list. But think about that. Right. 13 right. people have been sitting, right. waiting for this right. one because it's been so safe. Right. And that, that is a place where it is hard. And in some states, it's, it's much, much worse than even Virginia. Yeah. And oh, yeah. in, in Northern Virginia, we have two seats that, have, that are going to open yeah. up, right? Yes. And yes. one of which is not necessarily Republican, right? right. Or, no, it, have, well, one's definitely yeah, all Democrat. Yeah. The other yeah. one's it's, means it's Democrat. Yeah. It's a yeah. swing <laughs> just for, but yeah. Republicans got a very strong woman in that seat. They did. They did. Uh, you know, they recruited a very strong woman. And, um, you know, we put that seat as leaning Republican today. Yeah. So. Democrats are going <laughs> to. Sorry. Democrats are going to have to fight for that one. We're going to have to fight for that one a little bit. But you know, this has been. This is again somebody. Who, you know, Barbara Comstock has been very dogged in in sort of pursuing her her career. And she is a veteran of tough races. Yes, she is. Right. <laughs> she is. She is currently in the state state senate. senate. Yes. Okay. Um, so. Uh, so Virginia, so, so the incumbency, it's sort of like in an office, right? When the, the senior management is all male and you have to sort of wait until mm -hmm. people retire. But incumbency is such a powerful force, right, in American politics. And I don't know if it's become more powerful, if it's always been powerful. But that, that is one big barrier. That I mean, you can probably argue it's actually a little bit less powerful today than it used, than to, it be. used to be. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. And part of it's the party structure, part of it's the cost of races and and, fo and folks are frustrated about Congress right now. So you're seeing some retirements yeah. and hopefully not too many more. But uh, that's that's part of what's going on. So there's a little bit more movement in these races than there has been. Uh, but that being said, there's still a, a huge advantage, and we've got a redistricting problem, right. yeah. where we now have really safe Republican districts mm -hmm. and really safe mm -hmm. Democratic mm -hmm. districts, mm -hmm. and very mm -hmm. few, mm -hmm. very yeah. few, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. a couple yeah. in the middle yeah. uh, to fight over. And so that means we're fighting in primaries, and Republicans are fighting in mm -hmm. primaries. And so as you talk about how women do in this environment, now we do have a partisan problem. So Congress is about 19% women. But if you look at the Democratic caucuses, we're 30% women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, the Republicans are, not, are far, far behind. And so in a world where we have only safe Republican yeah. districts and we don't have any movement to get women into these right. races, we have a big structural problem. Mm -hmm. And folks will ask me, what can we do? And I said, well, they need, they need a ver real version of Emily's List mm -hmm. now. They need so, to put pressure on the party. <laughs> so all the redistricting to make these seats safe has been not good for female candidates then, it sounds like Well, I, I would beg to differ. In my class, so I came in in 2012, um, it's a huge class, 85 uh, new members, um, and, and more have been added since in specials. And we started out with um, 18 Democratic women, mm -hmm. three Republican women. So that'll give you a sense of the difference. But uh, definitely the redistricting helped. It was a high number mm -hmm. of yes. new seats and a high number of women and young people. And, and when um, we have a redistricting cycle, so which we just had, because the redistricting happened in 2010, there's a lot of turnover. There's mm -hmm. lot of turnover. Yeah. Um, there, but there's, there's going to be less until the next redistricting right. cycle. It's right. possible there's a little bit of an ideological factor in there on the, you know, on the Democratic Republican side. I mean, I think Emily's List and groups, uh, I mean, ha helping women to learn how to raise money and organizing in states to get a farm team is a huge difference. But if you talk about these extremely partisan primaries, you're, you're just, I think you're just more likely to find women who are comfortable on the left than women who are comfortable on the extreme right. It generally means you have to be anti-choice. It generally means a lot of values that I think there are just less women who subscribe to than men. It's just a little bit of a factor. So it, yeah. it narrows the field that, that Republicans can recruit from. And I think as they've, you know, a lot of great women who have left Congress, uh, you know, Olympia Snow in my state said yes. I, I, she couldn't take the pressure from the right. Um, they don't want to be primaried by the right, and they want to be more of the conciliatory, moderate player. So I just think you find more women getting mm -hmm. active in politics mm -hmm. on the Republican side, who that's the persona they want to be, not the 
ultra conservative. Right. We, we have plenty, and I'm not saying it's not a, a reasonable ideological view. I just think there's a smaller pool. And then, of course, there's the policies of the Republican Party, mm -hmm. which right now are not geared toward advancing women. And we see that not just in the candidates, but in the voters. I mean, that's why so many more women voters vote for Democrats than they do for Republicans. I mean, this is all yeah. tied together. Jennifer, would you agree with this? Well, I would agree, but I would also say that the women's vote is not monolithic. I mean, let's right. look at 2010 and 2012. If you look at the congressional vote, the national congressional vote, Republic, women actually voted one point more Republican in 2010 than, than Democrats, but 49-48. 2012, though, when Democrats successfully <laughs> talked about the war on women, um, you, you know, 55% of women voted with the Democratic Party as opposed to 44. Now, yes, there's a rounding error there. I know it doesn't equal 100. Um, that, <laughs> that voted with Republicans. So that does have something to do with it. And, and sometimes women on the Republican side can be easily caricatured. Um, I'm thinking about, like, Sharon Engel, who ran for the Senate in Nevada in 2010. Um, who was not a strong candidate, but she had this habit of saying kind of ridiculous things, and it just stood out more as a as a as a woman, sure. I think, than in Delaware as well. Uh, okay, yes, there was <laughs> Delaware. Um, yeah, another, I am not gonna. That's another I am, shade. Of yeah, I'm, th that's right. just another shade of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, come on. <laughs> I am never in my career going to see another political ad that starts with the line, I am not a witch. <laughs> <laughs> never say never. <laughs> never say no. You know, I'd like to make a point. Okay. Um, yeah. One side effect of states where there's a very dominant party that keeps women out, it's interesting. Occasionally, you'll see women being elected to top offices there from the non-dominant party. Mm -hmm. So like Christy Todd Whitman in New Jersey, she had an opportunity mm -hmm. to run because you know it, um, the party kind of right. is fine to take a winger, right? right? And right. then right. there's an opening, and they get elected. So sometimes you know, it's, it's not entirely clear cut. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Yes, you do all need to. I probably need to vote. Thank you very much. Getting us where we By all means, vote. Thank you. Nice to see Thank everybody. You so Thank much you. for coming. Yeah. I was very grateful. Um, <laughs> and actually, it looks like we've got about 20 minutes. So um, I think it would be a good time to open it, open up to questions because um, we're here for another 15 or 20 minutes, and would love to hear what the audience would like to talk about. Uh, and I think there's a microphone. That's going to, Faith, are you going to? Oh. <laughs> there we go. Uh, someone lean in. I know, it's fine. Uh, Rachel Lyons with the National Partnership for Women and Families. And I already got my does policy matter question in. So I'm going to ask one having done New Hampshire politics. Is there a role in the presidential, the fact of being a presidential primary state? New Hampshire, lots of women. Iowa, none. Like, what's <laughs> yeah, impact, no impact? That is very interesting you say that. Um, because Senator Ayotte said to me that she thought that was one of the leading factors for the high level of female participation in politics. And her argument was that women get involved so intently every four years that then that creates a base of activism that can be channeled into women's campaigns and their own candidacies. Um, but that's a very interesting point that Iowa is so very different. So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You would think that that when you when you hear that about New Hampshire, that would make that makes complete sense to me, and yet the opposite has happened in Iowa. Uh, I don't know if I have an answer for that because you know massive energy happens in Iowa every single election cycle. Women and men come together to get involved in those caucuses, uh, so there are always other factors involved in in Iowa. Uh, there are less opportunities. I mean, it is really something to have 400 house seats yeah. in your small state. <laughs> uh -huh. So there's, mm -hmm. there's less, op there's, that's yeah. <laughs> like everybody gets to be representative before yeah. they're gone. <laughs> that's the rule. <laughs> um, so, um, so, you know, what I think is going on um, is in Iowa is just sort of how the politics sort of started at the beginning. But what we're seeing, here's the good news. Things are changing. I mean, we're not only do we have Stacey Apple running for Congress, uh, we have three women 
running in Bruce Braley's open seat. Mm. So we have like uh, just riches everywhere uh, about this. And that's, that's a really, really good sign. And so we're seeing a lot more women in the pipeline. And this didn't happen overnight. I mean, uh, Emily's List and, and others have been working for years, if not, in fact, decades in places like Iowa to get those women into a place where they can step up and their state senators running, their state representatives running. So this pipeline really does matter. Not everybody comes from the legislature. Right. I mean, so that is true. And women, and that's the other thing I think is so exciting right now is women are coming from so many different aspects of life to run for office. That's really good. I mean, to see Michelle Nunn you know, step up as a successful CEO and president of Points of Light Foundation to run for this United States Senate seat, I just, I think it's fantastic. And she has a real shot of winning Georgia, just like Elizabeth Warren in Massachusetts in a state that had never right. elected a woman to the United States mm -hmm. Senate mm -hmm. until Elizabeth Warren. You know, so we're seeing, uh, we're seeing different folks able to get into these races and really change, change the dynamics, Absolutely. which is good. Um, in the front. I'm Nancy Carson. I'm a uh, freelance writer. Michelle Nunn had a little something going for her to begin with. She, <laughs> yeah. might, she might be that. the daughter of a <laughs> former senator. Uh, but she's a right. daughter she's of a, daughter, a former right? senator. Right. So but that's, that's right. good. Right. <laughs> and that, that would be in the tradition of women, <laughs> right. you know, women being part mm -hmm. of sort of political brands or political right. dynasties coming from their father. Or their Brought husband. in. Yeah. Very Grandmothered in. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Alexandra, you were speaking about generational change, and it occurs to me it's a lot of speculation about much younger women and how they're going to view their role. And they seem to have a, perhaps a changed idea of women's roles, bigger or smaller. And I'd like to know what any of you f are finding on college campuses and in really young, what I consider really young adults, how they're thinking about politics and running. It's an interesting question. I'm sure <laughs> you'll have a lot to say from the Emily's List perspective. But um, I did a piece about Senator Gillibrand many years ago. And interestingly, she and Senator Ayotte did not participate in student government in college. They both were very serious athletes. athletes. Mm -hmm. And they both served in sororities. They were active on campus, but not in student government. But when I spoke with um, all of her college buddies, they, they said it was kind of on her mind. So I think the, the point is that women now, young women, they have examples, right, like Senator Ayotte and Senator Gillibrand. And they're also, they're going to law school, you know, and they're going to medical school. They're, so I think it's sort of a natural extension of that to say, well, why wouldn't I run for office? All these other opportunities are available for me, available to me. And in 2012, we, we were able to successfully elect uh, three women to the House of Representatives under the age of 40 for the first time. You know, it's in Tulsi Gabbard from Hawaii who's, I mean, I might, I she's going to kill me, I'm going to get her age wrong, but I think she's like 32 or 3. I mean, just like, which is fantastic. And we're seeing, uh, we're seeing more of that. So it's, I think it's a really good, healthy sign. I mean, we all have like met male politicians who sort of had this as part of their life plan. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to practice law for a while, I'm going to do this for a while, <laughs> and then I want to run for Congress. Women haven't been doing that. And I think both Congresswomen pointed that out, that it was it kind of, fell into their lap, so to speak, or, or was presented as an option to them. But now I think women are putting it into a life plan. Maybe, you know, not in their 30s, but in their, you know, in their 40s. And, but they're, but it's, it's something you can plan that I don't think that they ever thought about before. It's interesting that you all raised law school because law is a profession that has, you know, half of women, half of law students now are female. And since law has tended to be a feeder profession for politics, you would expect mm -hmm. that, I mean, unlike, say, business school, business school is still about a third female. Mm -hmm. Law and medicine have been more conducive to having, having women come in. So you would think that that would propel, a, you know, if they're a parity in law school, you'd think that eventually women would be at parity in, in politics. Mm -hmm. So, and, and yeah, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Not just with lawyers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How about in the back in the black sweater? Um, hi, um, my name is Jennifer Clark. I'm from the Institute for Women's Policy Research. And um, on the topic of parity, we've actually projected that 
Uh, at the current weight rate, women will not reach um, parity in Congress until 2121, which is over a century from now. Um, so I was just wondering if the panelists could talk about more ways that we could speed up this process. I know we've talked about a lot of different recommendations, trends that are currently going on, um, but just some ideas about how we can speed it up so that we're not waiting 100 years yeah. for that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I would say um, encouraging women to run. Um, it's striking. You see, there's studies that have been done showing that women are much more likely to have decided to run. There was a study of women serving in state legislators, both men and women serving in state legislators, legislatures, and the women were much more likely, I think 25% more likely, to say that they didn't consider it until someone had recommended it to them. Um, so that, you know, telling someone you think is talented and would do well in public life, encouraging them to do it, seems to be like it almost opens a window or something within them. It just, and I, I think the, the report you're referencing is the Rutgers University right. Report, uh, which also has a great fact in there, which is you know, women, are, women just often think they're not quite qualified. You know, if anybody's read Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In, it's the same thing. Like, we don't have 100% of what the job description is, so therefore I can't do the job. And, and in this uh, Rutgers report, it talks about how, how so many men, I mean, it's something like you know, well over a majority of men who claim that they are unqualified to run for office still would consider running for office. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so there's also that, like, we've got to get our head around, like, you know, you don't need to have 100% of the pieces. You know, you just, and this is democracy. We need your voice. That's the most important piece in this. And so it's so true. Recruiting, moving women. Uh, we're seeing more and more women uh, running at the legislative level. And so if we can keep that up, uh, we're going to see, we're going to speed up this trend line. So we should have a, so we should have a lean in up. generation <laughs> pretty <laughs> soon of women who've read the book and taken it to heart. Elected, uh, you know, on the Democratic side, we had elected eight Democratic mayors in 2013. You know, we've got these great opportunities. I mean, we are, you know, we have set goals, you know, within the next, you know, these are, these are bold and, you know, it's going to take a massive amount of candidates to do it. but. Now, I've said to my organization, how do we get to at least 50% of the Democratic caucus? So we're at 30 in the, at the federal level. How do we get to 50? And how do we do it in 10 years? Now, there are some structural challenges with the districts that are in play to get there. But you can, you can map it out. It is about women saying, yes, I'm going to run. We need more women to run. I think there are going to be a couple of good cycles, this being the first one, mm -hmm. where you're seeing some of these longtime incumbents finally sort of retire and right. it's happening in democratic districts probably this cycle and next cycle because they really can't see getting the majority back before the next redistricting which you know unfortunate but it makes sense um, so if you sort of lift the incumbency ceiling in a lot in, in more districts mm -hmm. you're going to get more women running for the house I think that that's important um, Senate retirements has been a very big avenue for women and these last 2012, 2014, you've seen Democratic retirements. In 16 and 18, you're going to start to see some Republican retirements. So those, those things all help. Um, I think that parity by 2021 is the most depressing <laughs> thing I've heard this week. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. That's um, terrible. It, yeah, and I, I have happen. a hard time believing it's true. I went back and looked at some history, sort of preparing for this. And, um, you know, when I started working in this, Game, you know, women made up 6% um, of the Senate, and okay, now they're 20. At least I saw that in my lifetime. I will see a woman president. Yes, she will. And not <laughs> only in my lifetime, but probably within the next decade, um, one way or the other. And I think it's, you know, I think it's great that, at least on the Democratic side, if Hillary Clinton doesn't want to run. There are a couple of other women out there who, who are perfectly qualified and do want to run. It's, it's not like, Hillary Clinton's unique right. anymore. And that's bound to accelerate gender parity as well, yeah. do you think? I mean, yes. having yeah. a woman presidential candidate really or a female do. president is bound to accelerate female parity, I would think. And so retirements, as people get disgusted with partisan right. politics in Washington and retire, that'll leave some seats. And, and, and the momentum of seeing women on, on the top ticket has really mattered. And it's, and it's mattered in the states. I mean, having Governor Jean Shaheen mm -hmm. in New Hampshire when they did helped so many more women go, oh, 
well, I could do that too. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, and you often see two women senators in the same state. I mean, Maine, New Hampshire, mm -hmm. Washington, Washington yeah. California. Mm -hmm. California. And, and there's a, that's another piece of, oh, well, this is, we've done that. It's easy. We can, we can do that. that. It really opens up the doors. And so to see a woman at the top of the presidential ticket, I think, opens the floodgates. I mean, but even if you look at Geraldine Ferraro in 84 and, and Sarah Palin, I did not, obviously did not support uh, <laughs> last go around, but these cycles after that, you actually mm -hmm. saw an mm -hmm. uptick of women in their perspective, in their parties, running. So whenever you so a high-profile female it does, candidate, it, you know, anecdotally, it, we've seen an uptick. Yeah. Oh, um, that's really interesting. So I think yeah. it really opens the floodgates. Yeah. I think it's great. Oh gosh, <laughs> you pick, pick somebody, Lana. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm Ibrahim Mukman with Mukman and Associates, and I was just wondering if these promising trends are also uh, relevant for African American and other women of color. Yes, that's a great question. Yeah. And I, if I'm I, yes, I, I I do think that's that's absolutely right, and um, and we're really really excited about. It. I mean, think about you know as I was just talking about Virginia Eight and and our Assemblywoman Herring there is this great African American women who I just, I, we're really enthusiastic about. So we are seeing uh, more and more, but we have more work to do. And I would, you know, and I would love, you know, your thoughts separately on this is how do we find more opportunities, more districts for, for African Americans and Hispanics to run in uh, that aren't so specifically drawn, but that we can break through. And I think that's the next thing we all have to figure out. We do well in minority-majority districts, uh, but we need to do more. And that, to me, is the question of, of the next you know, decade or two. How do we figure that out? Because it's time. Because the demographics are changing. Um, hi, I'm Heidi Seek. I'm the COO of Democracy.com. And we are a platform that enables candidates to run for office at every level. We have a partnership with Vote Run Lead, the former White House project, to work on getting more women elected. But my question um, was going to be about the young people. I actually want to do a little case study about California, my home state. I've been away for about three years, and so something weird is happening in that state. I wondered if you had any thoughts. Be we had the Citizen Redistricting Commission, which we'd hoped would help the redistricting problem, but we also have all of these women that are running at this very high level. We have the Attorney General, we have the two senators, we've got Nancy Pelosi, but we're seeing a reduction in the number of women who are running for state legislature. So I haven't, I mean, I haven't really, I I'm worried. It's weird. So I wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Calif uh, the other country, California. <laughs> <laughs> it is always interesting when trends, you know, you always assume trend lines will be upward, right. but not necessarily. So I can't actually explain the state legislature. I can explain the state senate because there are state senate districts in California that are bigger than congressional mm, yeah. districts because mm -hmm. there are only 50 of them. Mm -hmm. So you have to run a congressional level <laughs> campaign mm -hmm. for a state senate seat. So, you know, you. There's nobody in New Hampshire who's ever run for the New Hampshire State Senate that's ever had to raise $3 million. Mm -hmm. right. um, but I think uh, the other thing that redistricting did help. OK, well, in the realm of the Cook Political Report, it helped because the more, the more competitive districts, mm -hmm. the, we like competitive districts. So that did help. It, it, it was not a very partisan drawing the citizens. You could actually apply to be on that that's mission. Right. Um, which I thought was funny. But here's the other thing that I think has made a difference, and that is the switch to top two primary as opposed to a partisan primary. It's a nonpartisan primary. The top two, regardless of party, move on. So there's less impetus to wait for somebody to retire, or it's almost encouraging you to get in the race, to forget about whatever good old boy network or whatever county organization network exists. Just get in and run. Um, so I think that that has opened some avenues. I cannot explain state, the state house. <laughs> well, and I, I, I can say that uh, Emily's List, in partnership with a number of great women's organizations in California, have come together to actively recruit uh, for this cycle, the next cycle, and many cycles to to stem this situation and, and think we can get in there. I think you know part of it is that California has always been at the forefront. I mean, there's 60 Democratic women in the House of Representatives today. 
18 of those women are from California, plus two United States senators. So we were fine. Like, everything's good. We have all these women out there. Uh, and so we probably didn't, you know, just in general, mind the store. And now we really, because we women need to be asked. So you need to be eternally and so vigilant. And so this never isn't, relax. we can't, at it least. It never just goes on autopilot. At least not, at, yeah. not this generation, uh -huh. and uh -huh. maybe generations coming up, that will change. Uh, so there's definitely, the good news is that there's a good group, coalition of groups that have come together uh, to work on this. I'm Valerie Young with the National Association of Mother Centers. I'm excited to hear that there are more women with young children running yeah, for Congress. Yeah, yeah. Um, with the, if you study motherhood, you know that there's uh, the Corell report out of Stanford about how mothers are perceived to being less committed and less competent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're offered jobs less. Their starting salaries are less, things like that. I'm very curious if you can say anything about how motherhood how the factor of a candidate's motherhood will be handled. Will she similarly be regarded as a less viable candidate, or will women find a way to use it? You know, if, if you can raise a house full of toddlers, clearly you have training <laughs> for, for Congress. Particularly um, this Congress. I'm, yes. yeah. <laughs> Parenthood for men, you know, is kind of right. like a neutral issue, right. but right. still yeah. women at, all, at work tend to downplay their motherhood. They don't have so many pictures mm -hmm. of their children up, perhaps. It, it might not be quite as bad as it was 20 years ago when I started practicing law, but it's mm -hmm. still kind of an issue. So how will the fact of a candidate's motherhood play out? I'm so glad you asked that because I, I was going to ask that as well. And it's really confusing right now. You look at Wendy Davis in Texas, and she's being accused of abandoning her young children when she went to law school at Harvard, even though it sounded like she was commuting back and forth. I'm not quite sure. But, um, and then you have, you have periodically have women who are criticized for bringing their children with them on you know, campaign, campaign airplanes and or you know, uh, state you know, state funded uh, trips and it, it is it is hard. How are how is the motherhood thing playing for women? I can tell you that Senator Ayotte pointed out repeatedly that when she was campaigning she was constantly asked, How are you gonna balance this with two young kids at home? And her point was it just wouldn't have been asked of a male it's candidate. And her her husband is actually more or less a stay at home dad. Right. I mean like he runs his right. own business, but he's the one right. who like keeps things running at home. And that, that is a pattern with yes. the politicians who have young children that yes. their that their husbands are taking the lead as yes. the child care. Very true. Yeah. I mean it's it's well it's the same way. Someone's gonna stay home with the kids. Right. You know, that's it. Right. It's not any different. It's just that there's a shift between the mother and the father, right? It's just. But so wouldn't, wouldn't you say that but the questions are hard? The questions are hard. It is getting so much better. Uh, that's the yeah. good news. It's getting a lot better, but it hasn't gone away. And they do get the questions all the time. Well, who's going to stay home with the kids? That was always the big one. Now it's more of how are you going to balance? That's been like right. the shift in question right. in the last four years. Who's staying home? Now it's like, oh, how are you going to balance this? Right. Um, I mean, it, it's not easy. It's, it's it's not easy. It's not easy for any. No. To be fair, it's not easy really for any parents of young children in Congress anymore because this isn't like it was 30 years ago, where they'd move their families mm -hmm. here, they'd put exactly. them in school here. You never went home. Everybody goes home on the weekends now, because electorally speaking, to win your campaigns, to win your next election, you got to be in your district all the time. So this, these are real hard questions, I think, that we you know, in, who work in politics are going to start dealing with much, much more. Mothers and fathers. I mean, there's a lot of fathers who are, are very distraught that they can't get home and yeah. see their kids, yeah. and their kids are still living in the state. I mean, think of Senator, Senator Baggage in Alaska. I mean, he's just yeah. in trouble. He's never going to see the kids, and they, they figure it out in a partnership. Yeah. Sort of, it does, as Anne put it, it takes a village. Yeah. Uh, but we need well, they moved the promise, and they yeah they ended up moving often yeah. they end up moving here. You, you just have first of all you know Hawaii, I mean Alaska's tough. It's I mean, a whole Lisa Murkowski <laughs> when she was appointed to the Senate, she went home every single weekend for the for the time she was appointed and had to right. run, and so she went home every weekend and took a red eye back. And she said, part of it is because I need to run, but part of it is because my my kids you know right. are young and I. I'm not going to go a month without seeing them. But I also know, um, since I spend most of my time with the Senate, both Senate mothers and fathers who have toy corners <laughs> in their room. Uh -huh. yeah. Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison, who adopted children yes, while did. she was in the Senate, right. had a pack and play. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you know, that was, you know, when they're infants and toddlers, that's kind of the way you do it. Um, a lot like moms I know who, who are work in, right, in the a, law firm, you yeah, know, yeah. the, yeah. the and, business. In other places, you know, I know moms who, you know, spend their lunch hours with their kids if they're in daycare. And it's just, it's different. But I still think kids are off limits for attacks. I mean, I don't, okay. I've never, unless it's a much older kid who's gotten right. in a lot of trouble. But <laughs> by that time, kids. they're kind of on their own. But young kids, um, you know, they, they're really off limit to attack. And I mean, I know, a, I know a couple of candidates who bring their kids to as many campaign events that are fun. You know, they're not bringing them to like policy discussions, but parades and I mean, they love being in parades, and then I know, then I know women who don't want their kids out at all. They want to mm -hmm. keep them mm -hmm. very separate. Mm -hmm. So it, be, it just becomes a personal choice, yeah. like a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. The additional effects is, is it a part of the story? I, and I think it is part of the narrative of why uh, these mothers of young children, because there's lots of mothers, uh, but these mm -hmm. are some mothers of young children, uh, they have a really great story of how they balance it and how they've been successful. I and mean, these are a lot of women who have all, they've already been successful, whether, whether they've been running big organizations or serving in the state senate. Uh, so it is part of the story, and it's a good part of the story, too. Well, there are studies that show that if you're the boss, it's actually easier to balance your family and work <laughs> responsibilities true. than if you're the staffer, perhaps, um, yeah. with less control over your schedule. Well, thank you all so much for participating. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We're five minutes over <laughs> at this point, so I think I should probably um, end the event. And uh, again, we'll be having lots more. In March, we're going to be um, looking at the STEM professions and women's progress right. in the STEM fields, and hopefully later on in the year, looking at Wall Street and finance. So I hope you'll keep coming back. And uh, thank you again. It was a great thank panel. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.